They want to do this so that they can earn salvation. If you earn it, it's no more a gift. But it is when you've done nothing that merits salvation. You've done nothing that qualifies you for life eternal. You just say, Lord, I come just as I am. I come unto you. He knows all about you. Knows all about me. Knows the you know bad things we've done. And knows the things you don't even want to remember at all. They're so deep. They're so great. They're so terrible. But God says, well, if you were to earn salvation, this will have disqualified you. But because you are not earning salvation, it's not by religious activity. And it is not by the works of your hand. It's not by the good, good things you have done or the good things you have not done. It is by the grace of God. Remember once again, grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. And this is a gift. That's why Romans tells us, we're going back to Romans again. We're looking at chapter 5 and we're looking at verse 17. Romans chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 17. Here it says again in verse 17, for if by the trespass of one man death range through that one man. It's talking about Adam. That is because we are the offspring of Adam. Then all our sin, all that the attitude of Adam and the guilt of Adam, everything passed on to us. You say, that's not fear. Well, I don't know whether that's fear or not. But you know, the, your complexion, your color, your brain, your eyes, and everything you got from your parents. And your parents got it from their parents. And then it goes back to your great-great-grandfather, grandmother. So it's the same thing in the moral sense. That the guilt that Adam had passed on to us. And the weakness that Adam had passed on to us. That's why David it was, David was very it was wise. And then by inspiration, he said, in Sin was I born, and in sin, iniquity did my mother conceive me. And therefore, it's, it's not just because of what I do. It's because of my nature. I was born into this world with that nature. And that nature naturally did what Adam did. That's why it says there that it's by that guilt of Adam I got this. And then in verse 17, it tells us there, the second part of the verse, how much more will those who receive, we have to receive it, he gives it, and then we receive it. He still receive God's abundance, uh, abundant provision of grace. And of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. In fact, as you look at many different chapters of Romans, it says exactly the same thing. It's saying that righteousness is a gift. It's not something that God is giving you this because you've done this. It's not like, you're so good, you paid so much, you paid so much, you paid so much, either in cash or in kind. And because you paid so much, of course, I must be fair to you and give you righteousness. No, nobody can earn this righteousness. Any kind of righteousness we have on our own will not take us to heaven. The only kind of righteousness that will take us to heaven is this evangelical righteousness that he gives us as a gift. And let's look at Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, I'm reading there from verse 25. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed behind, beforehand unpunished. Because of what he has done, the Lord says, the Lord Je that's God the Father saying, the Lord Jesus has borne your guilt, has borne your condemnation, has borne all your punishment. Therefore, everything you've done from the time of your birth until this moment, everything God says, I overlook, I forget. I will look at you as if you never sinned, and I give the righteousness of Christ, I give that unto you. How much do I pay, Lord? You don't pay anything. Christ paid it all. And we should be grateful to God that Jesus Christ paid the whole penalty and the whole price. And it says now that righteousness can be yours. Now, is that peculiar to the New Testament? You know, sometimes you'll find uh, there was uh, somebody who was preaching and he said that, you know, the people in the Old uh, Testament, they didn't have the grace of God. All they had was that you do this and you live. And the question is, how many of them did this and they lived? 
And it, some people say there's no grace in the Old Testament. I thought the Bible said, and Noah found grace in the sight of God. You think Noah was saved by his own works? No, by grace. Some people say there's no faith in the Old Testament. I thought it says by faith Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. And it was not because of his own works. He brought that sacrifice unto the Lord by faith. I saw the Bible says by faith Abraham, when he was called, he went out not knowing whither he went. I saw the Bible says by faith even Moses. This is what he did. So don't ever say think of, you know, there was no grace in the Old Testament, there was no faith in the Old Testament. Of course, there was grace there and there was faith there too. Do you remember Moses going to God and saying, Lord, if I found grace in your sight, count these people as yours. They have sinned and you're, you're right to punish them. And we're not coming because of merit. The children of Israel merited nothing. If I go to them, it is not because you are many. It is not because you are good. It is because I want to fulfill my covenant to your forefather, Abraham. That is why I'm doing this all by grace every time. In fact, the psalmist David knew about the grace of God. And you could ask David, why not for the grace of God, David, where would David be? That's why I said, you give grace and glory. Grace and glory in the Psalms. And so, we shouldn't think that all those Old Testament people, they walked their way to salvation. Nobody ever walked their way to salvation. It was all the gift of righteousness, the gift of evangelical righteousness. That's why it says, look at Abraham now. In Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, talking about Abraham, it says about Abraham, watch does the scripture say, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness? You see that even in the old covenant, Abraham believed God. It was credited unto him for righteousness. Then in verse 4, now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work but trusts, but believes God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. And then he says in verse 6, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. And so, as we go back to the Old Testament, the same thing is still the same grace of God, Abraham or David, of any of those worthies of old. It was this kind of evangelical righteousness that became acceptable in the sight of the Lord. It tells us in chapter 10 of Romans, and this is how we have this same righteousness in Romans. And it's very simple. And some people say, I'm finding it difficult to get saved. Uh, you know, what do you mean by finding it difficult to get saved? Because uh, they think they're going back to the same old uh, routine. And uh, they're thinking that I need to feel better so that I can have this. That means it's your feeling that earns you that salvation. Other people say, I need to improve so that I know I'm still a sinner and I know that I will never get up be for being a sinner, but I want to become a better sinner uh, before I can get this salvation. I'm going to, you know, clean up this and clean up this and clean up that, and then I can come to God and say, now, God, I've started this process of salvation. And I've cleaned up this one and this one and this one. And I even feel good now that I'm not as bad as before. I feel I can get that salvation now. That means I merit it now. Anytime you feel that this is by marriage, I've done this, I've done this, and I've done that. And because I've done that, I think I can come to God and say, can I have that salvation now? Give me that gift now. It's no more a gift because now you qualify. Every time you think about salvation for yourself or for your loved ones, your child, your husband, or anybody, understand this is the gift of God, and gift with no string attached. It is when we understand that, that this evangelical righteousness becomes ours. Look at what it says in chapter 10 of Romans. Romans chapter 10. From that chapter 10, I want to read chapter 10 verse 3 first before I go to the, verse, the verses I need. In verse 3 it says, Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God, 
and sought to establish their own, that is their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. It's talking about, uh, you know, those uh, Israelites at the time of Jesus Christ. They did not understand righteousness or God's righteousness. Because of that, they were trying to establish their own righteousness. And they were saying, God, I've done this. And when you compare this righteousness with your own righteousness, I think they match. And if I have got this, can you now top it up and give me the extra one that I need? And it never works that way. That's why those Pharisees, they were not saved. Even though Jesus Christ was in their midst. And he presented that salvation to them and that gift of righteousness unto them. And let's look at verse 6 now of that same chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 6. In verse 6, it's uh, telling us, um, verse 6, it says, But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will ascend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth that in, and in your heart that that is the word of faith which we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. See how simple this is. If you confess with your mouth, you are coming to the Lord. You said, I've been a slave of sin. I've been a slave of society. I've just been walking my own way. But now I come to receive and have Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. It says, when you say Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not that you might be saved, but you will be saved. And then it goes on to say, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And then it says, and it is with your mouth that you confess and that you are saved. And that's how we have the evangelical righteousness. And when we believe like that, and you just know, that you know that Christ died for me. It was for me he died. He's taking all my sins away. And I have his righteousness. Then that is settled. And there's some uh, converts that uh, they say, but pastor, I don't feel saved. You know, it will come back again to that. We think there must be something in us. Either before we get the salvation, we feel I'm ready now. What if you're ready and God is not ready? And what if what you are thinking you are ready about is not what God is looking for. Other people say, now I've got the thing now. And because I've got it now, I should feel something. Uh, it's, um, I think, uh, I don't want you to raise up your hand. Uh, think about if, if you're married. Uh, you know, you're married. You're still thinking, am I married? Am I not married? <laughs> are you married? <laughs> I said, are you married? Yes. Okay, okay, some of you are. Some of you are not. <laughs> Now, you know, before that marriage, you're thinking, you know, we're going to the altar and we're going to get married. And you picture it in your mind, the minister is going to say, do you take this man as a lawful husband and to keep with him? Yes, I do. And they do, it's going to talk to the man, do you take this woman? And you're imagining your mind and you think that when I get there, and then I, you know, take that uh, covenant and that vow. I'm going to feel taller. I'm going to feel bigger. There, I don't know whether I'll be able to contain that emotion. I hope I'll be able to control myself because this is going to be something. And surprisingly, you get there. And, the, you know, the ministers are standing before you. And they say, do you take this woman? And you say, I do. Then you pinch yourself. I'm not feeling like I thought I would feel. <laughs> and then they talk to the woman. Do you take this man? You say, yes, I do. And you feel normal, you feel regular, you feel ordinary, and then you come out there, you're almost, almost, almost even forcing yourself to smile. And they say, are you married? You say, I think I am. <laughs> are you thinking you are married or you are really married? The point is, you are married and you know you are married, but you might not feel any different. It is not how you feel. The transaction has been done. And the deed has been signed. The blood of Jesus has been shed. And Jesus said that it is finished. And because he said it is finished, whether you feel it or not, you feel high, you feel tall, you feel great, you feel excited, you feel like running. Some people say, I felt like walking in the air. That's good for you. But whether you feel anything or not, 
that is the faith. It is not by feeling, it is by faith. Forsaking all, I trust him. I gave my life to Christ, and he gave me his righteousness. And I know I'm saved because his word said so. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what I did. I called on the name of the Lord, and guess what? I am forgiven. And now I have that righteousness. And if Jesus came today, I'm telling you, I'll be one of those people that will go with the Lord. That is our faith, the gift of evangelical righteousness. And thank God I have it. I said, thank God I have it. Thank God I have it. Now, the glow of an enduring righteousness. The glow of an enduring righteousness. It, there's something that happens when Christ comes into our hearts. Remember, number one, external righteousness. That doesn't do anything. Number two, evangelical righteousness. That's the initial deposit of his righteousness in my heart, in my life. And now I know I am a child of God. I'm on my way to heaven. But between now and the time I get to heaven, there is something that is glowing. There's something that is shining. It's the glow of an enduring righteousness. Not just that I got that righteousness then, and the second day I've lost it. Or the second day is no more there. It's a gift. And it's always there. And God will not repent of what he has done. He's giving it to you. And he's not saying, ah, wait a minute. Why did I give that gift of righteousness to that fellow? I need to re-examine again because, you know, God is always worse. Whatever decision God takes now, he knew about it before he took it. And therefore, it's not going to change after he has taken that decision. You might feel good or feel ordinary or feel whatever you're feeling will not change God. He has given you the gift. You know, it's just like, you know, some people, they easily change their mind, but that's not God. If somebody says, I want to give you something, and uh, then he's bought uh, this car, and this is the key. And then after you say, then you come, and remember, he said, this is a gift. And then you came, and he gave you the, the key. You saw the car. And then the man saw you driving that car, and then he begins to think, why did I give him that? I should be driving that myself. He wants to change his mind. And it's good you drove away very quickly because, you know... <laughs> But want to get it back from you again. But God is not like that. His salvation is a gift. And after he has given you that gift of salvation, he doesn't say, oh, I'm thinking about it again. Should I have given him that? Should I have given her that kind of gift of righteousness? I've got it. I've got it. I said, I've got it, I've got it. And you've got it, and God will not withdraw it away from you in Jesus' name. That's why you have an enduring righteousness, a righteousness that abides, that stays, and it glows, it shines in your life. In fact, we're told that at the end of the day, that is uh, when the Lord will come to take the account of everyone, that those who are righteous, they'll be shining. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 43. Matthew chapter 13, we're reading from verse 43, verse 43. In verse 43, here is what it says, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He was ears to hear, let him hear. The righteous, the righteous will shine. That means what makes us shine, what makes us glow is this righteousness that abides and remains in our lives. You know, you now live your life, you live a different kind of life. The spirit of God is within you. And anytime a temptation comes, the spirit will say, no, a child of God doesn't do that. And then you are checked and say, praise the Lord, something is new. I used to just live my life without you know, having any conscience or whatever, but now the spirit of God tells me, a child of God cannot do that.